podcast, y'all. Hey, y'all. I got a heavy hitter in here today. Look, look, he got his muscles. He's showing his muscles and everything. But I'm so happy that you are here. I'm ecstatic to be here. I got to introduce you to the audience because he, you are brand new to my audience. You're mm-hmm. not brand new to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to tell you I love your podcast first and foremost. Absolutely. I appreciate it. And likewise, that's, yeah. that's why I'm here. I yeah. absolutely love what you got going I on. I love ahead. what you're doing. So y'all help me welcome Maurice, the people's choice. Mm, people's source. People's source. People's See, source. It's so good. Now. It's so good. <laughs> Messed it up. People source. The people source, and you are a podcaster yourself. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So I uh, and the podcasting you know thing is fairly new to me. Obviously, you and I have our had our, had our conversations. Conversation. And, uh, yeah. It's something that I've always wanted to get involved in, mm-hmm. um, but I didn't want to ever sit in front of people and have absolutely nothing to talk about. I got you. I think there's, you know, there's so many different podcasts out here, and I don't, you know, every, you know, conversation is relative to, you know, different people. Absolutely. For me, I felt like getting involved in this, I wanted to have something impactful that I know could uh, really spark some type of conversation. I, I try to stay away from the word controversy, but I obviously understand that things that we say can become controversial. controversial. Yeah. But I wanted to make sure that, you know, anytime I sat in front of a microphone and a camera, that I was uh, bringing something to the table where people could actually take what I'm saying for face value and say, you know what, he's he's yeah. bringing value. relevant and value conversation yeah. to the table. So, and you listen, you are doing it. Mm-hmm. I literally, I, I I found you on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, I always tell my audience I'm a podcaster who loves podcasts, but more than that, I love people's hearts. And I feel like it's something that you can't fake. No, not at all. It's something that regardless of whether you're watching through the screen or even listening, you can feel people's heart. Mm -hmm. And in what you're doing, I just feel your heart in it, Mm -hmm. right? And that's kind of how we connected and how we had a conversation. And I got you here some form of fashion. God works in mysterious ways. Quick, Quick. We had the conversation. I think we had maybe one or two more after that. And it was just like, all right, look, we're going to get on the show. We're going to get going. Yeah. So. And and what's crazy is though I know you're originally from New York, correct? Right? You live in Texas. I live in Houston, Texas. Now I've been there for maybe three and a half years. Yeah, look so, how they exchange working. I'm like, you know what I'm saying. So I, now I was we, like, you coming for real? I, I I ain't gonna tell y'all, but I ain't believe him um, for a while. I was like, he coming? I'm put it on the calendar, but I wasn't sure. My word is born. Yeah, if I say I'm doing something, I'm I'm doing it. His word is born. <laughs> communicator like beyond measure and I applaud you for that but I'm so happy to have you here nah shout out to Uh, you for having me here no shout out to you for even coming like this is this is definitely gonna be an exchange I'm gonna do do this now before we even really get to you know exchanging this truth I was about to say I went and wanted to make sure I got her shirt that's his podcast y'all we gotta make sure that uh, we show the love when we come to the exchange place yes and thank you for sure I love it. Now, when y'all see me rocking this, y'all know what's up. Right? <laughs> and the red look good on me. See, I was right about that. So I said you want That's the black right. or the red. Yeah, I like black, but yeah. I feel like I got enough black. Yeah. You hook me up. But I, um, I got you. So you're an officer. Let's, I am. let's start there. Um, part of what I want to talk about today, and I was thinking about this even coming here, um, is just some traumatic experiences that I've had with law enforcement, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And especially, I think, during the pandemic, I feel like, for me, um, when the whole George Floyd thing happened, um, I have two sons. Mm -hmm. Um, My... My view of police police officers was always, I grew up in a very urban area, right? So I've seen a lot. (laughs) I'll say that, right? But I don't live in that environment any longer, and Mm -hmm. I remove my children from that. But in the the instance with where, again, where I felt like, I don't want to say my view got changed, but I do want to say my my lens got open wider of just like me looking at my boys and though I know they're black young men right where I was like really nervous every time they left the house for mm-hmm. a different reason right because in my neighborhood people don't look like us predominantly for right sure. my oldest son at that particular time mm-hmm. had just really started driving mm-hmm. and he was transporting 
my youngest son, like, back and forth to basketball practice. And every time they would leave, I had to, like, literally sit them down and really teach them how not to die in that environment. I'm like, oh, my God, you're driving my car. What if they get pulled over? And, again, from the experience that I had, even as a woman being pulled over, there's a level of fear. Even, like, I ain't ain't do nothing. I'm driving. If a police officer is behind me, I'm there's something that happens Mm -hmm. in my body. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like... Why is that? Where did that come from? And just from an officer's perspective, you being a, a black man, like, what does it feel like to be on the other side of that? Like, you put on a uniform, but you're also out of uniform at certain times. So it's funny because part of my reasoning for becoming a cop mm-hmm. was due to certain things that I've encountered and experienced prior to me being a cop. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, I remember, and I think I, you know, I think I addressed this on one of my one of my episodes on my podcast. I remember being, I believe I was older, maybe 20 years old. Okay. And uh, I had an a unmarked car pull up behind me and an unmarked van pull up in front of me. Mind you, I'm two blocks away from my mother's house. I'm in my mother's car. I don't even have my own car at this time. I'm in my mother's car. And uh, they're like, what are you doing over here? Like, I live over here. Yeah. Let me see ID. Give him my ID. I'm like, what, what? what's going on? What's your boy's name? And I'm just like, look, like, respect, like respectfully, any questions that you have for him, you know, ref, you know, direct your questions solely to him. Anything that you have for me, I'll answer. Oh, you don't want to tell me your boy's name? Get out the car. Got mm-hmm. me and my boy out the car. Searched me, searched him. Searched my mother's car, trashed her car. And when it was all said and done, they left. That was one moment for me. I, I swear to God, we got back in the car and I said, yo, um, what you thought about all that that just happened? It's like, I mean, it's, it's just what it is. Like, when you grow up in that environment and you get so used to it, it's, we, we was actually numb to it. And I just, what I, but I wanted to know what he felt yeah. more than anything. Like, what did you feel about what just happened? He just was like, it is what it is. For me, I didn't take it as it is what it is. Mm. I like I was upset. I'm like, why did you and I just get pulled out this car? Why did we get searched? Why did my mother's car get searched? And throughout that whole process, why wasn't there any information related to us for why any of that was happening? Mm. So I started like, you know, I'm thinking I went home. I told my mother all about this whole ordeal. And her thing was, well, fortunately, you know, everything worked out. And, you know, Things didn't get worse because obviously we know things can get worse. Absolutely. But from that moment, I started seeking information. I wanted to know what cops can do, but more so what cops cannot do. And I think that's part of the reason why I got into law enforcement. Yeah. Just seeking information, wanting to know the overall process, the initial approach to everything, and why is that the approach? I, I, for me, personal life or professional, everything has to make sense. I have, I, I, I don't know. That's just me. Yeah. I have to make sense of everything. Gotcha. So the moment something doesn't make sense to me, I'm gonna go start. Try, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna try to start finding answers. Gotcha. And uh, that was part of. The, that's one big reason why I became why a you cop. Became a cop. So I guess in the process of becoming a cop, when you've experienced something like that. Like what? What made you continue? Did you did you see? I guess that level of behavior while you're like in the academy, because I, I and I've had I, and I had and have people who are officers, right? So I know going through kind of that that whole training and all of that, I know how they were treated, mm-hmm. so to speak. So like, what made you continue through there? Because I know one of my and I call her my little sister. She's a she's an officer. She was like she, the way they get treated is not. Like a great a great experience, and there were times she was like, "I really think law of enforcement may not be for me." Right. I mean, if I'm being honest, mm-hmm. we want you to be honest. Right. <laughs> I uh, I didn't really think anything of like the training the aspect training. of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I was a correction officer prior to being a cop, gotcha. so I was on Rikers Island for two years. Okay. So I knew I the whole you know. Fair factor thing, it kind of plays a part in just them needing them needing to get you to a point where everything that they say and everything that they're looking for you to do, you're able to snap in right away and get it done. 
without, you know, any hesitations. I get the whole fear factor part of it. So okay. I didn't really, I didn't necessarily take training as why are they treating us this way? way? I don't really, I didn't really, feel, you know, read too much into that because I know that's just part of the, that's just part of the process. Okay. Um, and and being one hundred with you, mm-hmm. I didn't have any real initial thoughts behind law enforcement. Uh, obviously, everything that I went through in my personal life, it was what it was. But the initial approach to getting involved into it, I, I really just kept an open mind. And in the beginning, I didn't even know why I was doing it. To really? be per- to be perfectly honest, I, I would go to work every single day, and I'm just like, All right, this is. I guess this is just part of it. This is part of. This job. is me entering a new world. So my thing is, how can I really have a real solid opinion on this right mm-hmm. now when I don't even know really what I'm getting into. Yeah. So that was me also learning. As they say, learn on the job. That was me learning on the job, figuring out their way. Yeah. So when you don't know something, when you get a, when you get introduced to it, it's going to appear normal to you. It's going to seem normal to you because you've never done it before. So you're just you're following the lead. You're sitting back and you're trying to pay attention and you're trying to figure out your your what's going to be your lane and what approach that you're going to take with this. But you're also so new that you're green. You don't know. So everything that you see and everything that you hear, it's going to appear normal to you. Okay, this must just be this, this must, this be, must how, be the way. How it goes. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm the new guy. These are people who obviously have time because they're the ones at the academy teaching me. Yeah. So this must just be the cop way. Gotcha. And if I'm gonna in, if I'm gonna integrate myself into this lifestyle, then obviously I need to adapt to the cop way. So in, I guess, adapting to the cop way, was there a point you were like, okay, this is kind of the the norm, but that's not who I am? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So when did that happen? I want to say maybe six months of me being on the job. Mm-hmm. So out the academy and actually now practicing the job. Yeah. I, I want to say about six months where I got to the point where like, I don't necessarily know where I fit in all of this. Mm. You know what I mean? Because the moment I got out the academy, within three days, I had a lieutenant asking me about arrests. Within three days. So, like, number of arrests that Absolutely. you Absolutely. Within three days. It, this, was, this is exactly how we did it. We're standing roll call. Roll call is where we meet up in the morning for them to give us our assignments. Yeah. He said, all the rookies, raise your hand. Obviously, I'm one of the rookies. I raised my hand. Yeah. How many of you guys got a collar? A collar's an arrest. Okay. How many of you guys collared up? We've been in the street four days. So, you know, still brand new, so still not knowing the cop way, not knowing what's accepted, what's not accepted. So now I'm, my natural instinct and my natural thought process is, okay, so obviously they're very big on making arrests. So this for him to ask us that question four days in, yeah. this is something that they truly care about. So now you're going out there and you're just you're trying to find it. I was about to say, so now you're looking you're for You're literally somebody. looking for something to happen. So you're doing a bunch of traffic stops. You're trying everything in your power to find anything that can allow you to have contact with a person to look for a potential arrest. Wow. And after about six months, I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, this, this, this is just not sitting right with me. Something doesn't feel right about this. Yeah. Doesn't feel right. And I don't care how minor, if it's an arrest, they want you to bring it in. Damn. I pull <laughs> you over for a suspended license. Yeah. You got. You should lock me up. I t- Bring it in. Not, hey, look, just inform you, your license is suspended. Spend you might seriously want to get that, you know, taken care of. It's, no, I need you to step out of the car. Damn. Yeah. I'm trying to process that. Yeah. Wow. I need you to step out of the car. So the level of pressure that are on, like, rookie officers or mm-hmm. officers in general mm-hmm. who have adapted to that is off the chain and I probably ran into a couple of them. It's insane. I'm, <laughs> where, sh- I'm sure you have. Yeah. It's where, insane. Where I feel like, and it, and this is a, a crazier story, but I'm in my neighborhood and I was dropping my younger son off. This is a, a couple of years back. And you know how they hold the traffic for, um, you know, when the kids are crossing. Mm-hmm. And then he tells people to come on. I'll never forget this. I don't know why that story brought up that. And 
he's like, you know, come on. And I guess I'm not moving fast enough, but again, I'm kind of cautious because you just, you know, did the the kids. Right. And then he tells me again, like, stop. And he goes into this whole, you must not be from around here, which of course, you know, you think I'm no, not. That plays or whatever. A role. Yeah, absolutely. Um, where I am. And he goes on to tell me how he could. Uh, and I was like, arrest me. He could he could send me a ticket to my house or whatever. At this point, I'm like, bruh, because I'm like, I live here, but I ain't from here. Right. Everything is going through my head. I'm just like, but ultimately, I'm like, I want to go home. But I'm like, where did that even come from? Mm-hmm. Like, it wasn't like, ma'am, no, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to tell you to stop. Mm-hmm. I wasn't telling you to come on. But he went on this whole rant. And again, if I would have been in the other, I could have ended up in jail. Absolutely. Like, Let me tell you, what I at least... My my experience is I've been on this job for six and a half, seven years mm-hmm. between two departments. What I recognize most about this job, whether dealing with the public or us actually dealing with one another, yeah. the fear factor aspect of the job is what gets put to the forefront. It's like on this job, they need you to... They need to have they need to instill fear in you in order they feel in order for them to feel that they can control you. And that and that bleeds into the streets. Because if that's exactly how you deal with us, whether sergeant, lieutenant, chief, whatever your rank is, mm-hmm. if that's how you deal with us, guess what? When we go outside, that's exactly how we're gonna deal with the people. That bleeds into the streets. Yeah. You know what I mean? So everything with us is a fear factor tactic to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a, not humanized. It's, you lose the human aspect. Yeah. So now when you go out there you, and you're dealing with people, you're not looking at people as people. It's a number. It's all numbers games. Mm. It's all a numbers game. So do you, let, let's go back to the numbers game. So do you get in, not necessarily in trouble, but are you penalized yes. for not? <laughs> yes. So you're penalized for not having enough arrests or tickets or really? Absolutely. So. But what if when, nothing was going on? Like what if no, nothing? no, you're gonna oh, you're gonna find it. You're gonna find it, or they or they'll find it for you. Absolutely. That's so scary. My again, not so much, not at all, really, with Houston. Okay. The dynamic of the job is a bit different out there. Um, okay. I have my opinion about, you know, just police work as a whole. But if we're specifically narrowing it down to NYPD. Yeah. At the end of the month, they are looking at your monthly activity, as they would put it, your activity. They're looking to see. And mind you, there's multiple sections on that paperwork. How many calls you ran that month? Um, how many reports you generated that month? They're going to two sections: arrests, summonses. That's it. And if those have zero, you better believe something is coming after that. One hundred percent. Wow. They're gonna look at you. You brought in zeros. Why? And like you just said, well, what if nothing was happening? What's nothing happening? Are you telling me that people can't follow rules? That's what I mean. You like, know what I mean? It's... And in their minds, no. You're telling me in 30 or 31 days, you couldn't find a person on a cell phone, a person on a seatbelt. I mean, not wearing a seatbelt. Uh, anything. A person not urinating in public. A, per- a person idling their vehicle. Where idling, what I mean is... Leaving your vehicle unattended, but the, the, the engine is still running. Yeah. You couldn't find any of that in 30 days. Person in use their right or, or left signal to turn. You didn't see any of that in 30 or 31 days. And in their minds, that's not possible. They can't fathom that. Wow. So, yeah, you are going to be on punishment, quote, unquote, if that's the case. Damn. Whether you're standing on a foot post for whatever amount of hours. Being told to go stand in front of a project building just because. Now, that's your post today. Don't move. And then you tell other cops, you better not go help him neither. Don't don't pick him up. Don't drive him. Don't go bring food to him. You're going to go stand there for eight hours. That seemed like some gang shit. <laughs> and it's like, well, you obviously don't know. You're not making arrests, so what do you need a car for? Wow. 
Mm. So just go stand on your feet then. You don't, you're don't. you not making arrests. So just let go people see you. Stand outside. It's 10 degrees. I'm freezing. Go stand outside. That's horrible. And people can't fathom this stuff. I know. I'm over here like, wait, what? <laughs> but now here's the problem. If you deal with me like that, now I'm angry. I'm bitter. So now when I deal with the public, how do you think I'm coming off? Yeah. That... Angry and bitter. And then that's only going to make people find stuff so they don't get in trouble. So now I'm not standing in 10 degree weather. Yeah. because On I, my feet for eight hours. I was about to say, I don't want to be in front of the projects cold and standing here. So I'm going to find, I'm going, I'm definitely finding something. So now when you're that mom who's running late to work, your child is running late to school, you make a turn that you might have, you know, you didn't see the sign, but you couldn't make that turn between a certain amount of hours. And you make that turn because that's the quickest way for you to get, you know, your son yeah. or daughter to school. And you get pulled over now. But I'm that cop who just stood in 10 degree weather for not making arrests or writing a certain amount of tickets. And I'm that cop that I'm pulls you over now. Guess what? <laughs> I don't care. There's yeah. nothing you could tell me. I don't care now. I'm giving you a ticket. Mm-hmm. And you see how you just, I just, the job naturally has removed the human side of me now. Because it's like, I'm not standing in 10 degree weather. Yeah. But you have a decision to make. You can either allow that to have you get rid of your morals and ethics. Yeah. Or you can stand by your morals and say, well, I'm not doing that to a person if I don't need to. So guess what, ma'am? Have a good day. You're not getting that ticket. Yeah. And that was my biggest thing once I feel like I found my way on this job. I was not willing to get rid of my morals and my code of ethics. If I decided that the best solution for me was to have a conversation with the person to find some type of, so, you know, solution to whatever problem might have existed, then that's what I was gonna do. Yeah. I wasn't. The, I'm not that guy. So quick to pull out my hand, pull out my handcuffs, or pull out a ticket book, because it it would appease, you know, others. Not me. I'm not, not that sure. guy. I love that, and I think first of all, I applaud you for that, because I think that's such. <laughs> it's such a hard place to be. And I'm, again, I'm always kind of thinking both sides of it, right? Mm -hmm. For the officer who is just like, hey, I want to be in law enforcement, and I'm all gung-ho to Mm -hmm. do that, to kind of be put in that position is already wrong, right? right? And then it's only going to be kind of like the the downward spiral effect Mm -hmm. of, you know, us being, you know, the the regular folks is just, I'm driving to work or whatever, that's affected by it. But both people are... Are affected, and that's what people got to know and understand. Contra- contrary to popular belief, mm-hmm. this is not one big happy family. You know, a lot of people have this notion and, and, and the idea that oh, cops, you know, they're going to protect one another. They're going to make sure. Excuse me. I no, feel like no that ma- normally. You yeah. know what I mean? But contrary to popular belief, that's not the case. There's a lot of ego on this job. Mm. There's a lot of ego on this job, and you have a lot of people in this job who want to make it a point to let you know. I'm the one in charge. Yeah. So me being a cop, you know, I'm the lowest guy on the pole. I don't outrank anyone. And in, if I'm this confident individual who comes to work every day, who has a certain aura about me, and I'm not concerned about what everyone else has going on. Gotcha. You know what I mean? I'm comfortable in my own skin. Better believe there's a sergeant or a lieutenant somewhere who wants to let me know he's in charge. And he's gonna present something to me one day to let me know, yeah, you're confident and you are you have this aura about you and but when you come in here, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. And I'm gonna make sure that you that you know that. Wow. A lot of ego around in, in, in this line no, of work. I, I I agree. I always say and don't neither, you know, you or your or your friends to be offended in that. But mm-hmm. like a lot I feel like there's a lot of officers who were the kid who got beat up in school and never had authority and now they have authority mm-hmm. and it's so misused. It's so funny. Me and my old partner, who's here with me by the way today, mm-hmm. but um my old partner, him and I were sitting in the car for eight hours mm-hmm. and we would just speak talk all day yeah. and that's one of the things that we would always discuss like just the overall personality on this job and he used to say it to me all the time it's like I'm not cool when I come here I'm cool when I'm leaving mm. I'm not cool when I get here this is just work and I know how to deal with people I'm okay with dealing with people I'm cool once I leave here that's when my that's when my coolness kicks in 
It's the opposite for a lot of these other individuals on this job. Yeah. You weren't the cool guy. You weren't the guy who got the attention that you were seeking. You know what I mean? You were just a presence. People saw you. People knew your name probably, but no one. your presence never shook anyone up. But now you're in a position to where whether a person wants to or not, they're going you're they're gonna have to deal with you at some point. Yeah. And you're gonna make sure that you assert your dominance by any means necessary. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, I'm here. And you know what? You might not want to talk, but you're gonna talk to me. Yeah. Now I'm in control. I can I'm in control. Yeah. You stop and you listen. Mm. And it's a lot of that. It's a lot of us trying to assert that dominance. It's like you don't feel good about yourself. And this is the that uniform makes you do that because you probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. The people that you speak to like that, you probably wouldn't speak to them like that if you weren't wearing the uniform. I was about to say, you know what I mean? In a different situation. And it's like just be who you are. Don't let don't put that uniform on and lose your mind. If you don't talk like that to people when you don't wear the uniform, then why are you doing it when you put it on? Mm, it's a lot of that. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's a lot of that. I 100 percent understand. I never want to. Uh, Give the uh, the impression that you know cops are just, you know just terrible people no. and they have nothing better else to do than to bother people. I don't do that on my platform. I'm not going to do it on your platform. You have cops out here doing remarkable things, who are truly handling situations that most people probably try to stay away from. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's not a it's not an easy job, but you also have to have an identity when you take a job like this. You need to know who you are and don't allow the job to become your identity. Because when you mm -hmm. do that, you're losing all sight of the real reason for why cops even patrol the streets, why they, you know, investigate crimes. You're, 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 you're dismissing all of those things based off what you're internally lacking in yourself. So let me ask you this. Um, with that, and I agree with that, do you think there is any pre-work that could be done to identify if people will misuse that like because I think I also think a lot of that is psychological or and I know you guys go through some type of psychological test and not all enough. that kind of thing but I was about to that was going to be my question like do you think there's not enough investigation to people's past to kind of know and I don't think you would get a hundred percent but that it would make a difference if we could like identify that beforehand or say, hey, you might want to work on this or go through there. And I also know it sounds crazy, but I had I actually had my brother come on who's who's a cop. And we talked about just therapy in law enforcement, how you have that it you have that testing previously, but throughout me. with all you guys see with everything that you go through, that's not something that's consistent or something that is a prerequisite. Like, hey, you have to do this. Oh, at this point, when you're going to this level, you need to go back and we need to do another evaluation of that. Because I think a lot of what you're talking about in identity is like self awareness, mm -hmm. knowing who you are, those types of things that come out literally in therapy. So it's not the little kid who got beat up their whole life and now they have the opportunity to be a cop and now they're taking out on everybody mm -hmm. what bullies and people but a lot of times you see that so I think it'd be very difficult for any department to consistently have their cops evaluated reason being is mm -hmm. because most cops will probably end up saying something that would come off probably a bit alarming. Okay. Which means now, well, we obviously, based off what he said or what he or she said, can't have this person on the streets. They might mm -hmm. possibly be a liability. Gotcha. So you will be removing a lot of cops from the job, not taking the job from them, but just removing them from the street aspect of the job because obviously now they're going through something. Yeah. So I think the job, po policy-wise, or in, if you incorporate the politics of this, mm -hmm. if we do that, we're risking taking a lot of cops off the street. Off the street, okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I don't think any department is prepared to do that. Because in my opinion, I think if you sat a cop in an environment where it was just him and the person who was evaluating them, I think a lot of cops would end up saying something that they know they wouldn't say to anyone else. 
but they're going to say it there because it's the setting. It's a more comfortable and a safe, a safe environment. environment. So it's like I want to express this, and I've been holding this in for so long. But now what happens once I say it? Yeah. And the department, I don't, I don't think any department is willing to take that risk. Mm. So here's where the politics come into play. Okay. Departments have these, like, I don't necessarily know what the units are called, but they have these units set up where your 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 identity is anonymous. If you need to make a call to, or more so, your identity is not anonymous, but whatever you say will be considered to be confidential. No one will say anything about this. Okay. Um, but that's not. I don't. You, that's not true. Because if I say, hey, look, I feel like killing myself. The job is stressing me out so much that I feel like killing myself. There's a very good chance that is not going to remain confidential. Really? You can't. How? I just told you I feel like killing myself. I guarantee you within a couple hours, I'm going to have someone at my door to pick up my guns. Mm. But see, that's the politic aspect of it. It's yeah, like, hey, we have we have that. something set up for where if cops want to have conversation Patience. and really get off, you know, anything off their chest, they can do that. Yeah, but depending on what I say, now might put me in a position to where my job might potentially be taken from me or I'm going to be on a psyche valve. And nobody want to be there. And no one want to be there. Yeah, I know. I and know. you get, and you know, cops feel like they have to try to blend in with other cops. So now, if I'm that guy, I get deemed to be the guy who who's always going through something. Uh, you know what I mean? So now, I get it. if I came in here, I have low self esteem. I have no confidence. I'm trying to fit in somewhere in an environment that I feel has already embraced me. Hey, I'm you're not the cool guy if you go talk to a person and and, and you know express what you're really going through. Cops yeah. don't do that. Oh yeah, now I feel like I can't. I can't speak. I gotta just hold and channel all this energy in. But, but I guess that and devil's advocate, and I one hundred percent understand that. But on the other side of that, then what happens to that person? Because that person inside is like. I can tell you what happens to that person. I know a girl who was in my, in my class with me in the academy. She killed herself. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, that's the scary. I, I think that's the scary part. And again, I'm always looking both sides. It's like, I get it. Nobody to talk to type thing. And after a while, you go on one way or another. Mm -hmm. There's no coincidence that, and I, I can, I'm not completely accurate with the number, but I believe mm -hmm. in year 20, talk to me, bro, 22, or uh, year 2020, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. I want to say about 11 police officers in New York City killed themselves. That's not by coincidence. No. But you have to realize it's coming from both aspects. Yeah. I'm going outside and I'm dealing with other people's problems for eight hours a day. But I'm also going inside and I'm dealing with all of this ego and I'm dealing with your problems because... You're low on yourself and you have low self-esteem. So now I'm technically dealing with your problems, yeah. too. And you got regular just home problems. And I got my own problems. <laughs> like you got your regular stuff. So my whole day is problems. It's problems. But when you go to work, you're expected to channel that energy and keep an open mind and be fully coherent to what's going on I around you at all times. Wow. And that's almost impossible. It's impossible. It's 100% impossible. So it starts from... The inner structure first. If we change how we police, mm -hmm. if we change how we deal with one another, I can guarantee you things get better. Yeah, I'm a firm believer. Cops, this job, this is not a, a proactive job. This is a reactive job. Cops can't create problems. We're not there to create a problem. And that's another thing that needs to, that whole idea of go look for it. Cops are not supposed, supposed to, to create, create problems. It. Cops are supposed to respond to problems and try to find a solution to a problem if there is indeed a problem. Yeah. That's a cop's job, not to go find problems. So we need to get rid of some of the, the initial process. approach and the process behind yeah. it. When they tell us, hey, go beat, you know, go beat the bushes, go create cases for yourself. You know what I mean? Be that person. Start investigations. Yeah, it's all, it all sounds good yeah. until something goes wrong. Who's taking the blame? Because the ones up top ain't going to say, well, you know, that's what we want them to know. You're not going to say that. Somebody got to take the blame because popular demand says so. Yeah. Somebody's going to take that fall. 
It's going to be me. Wow. So now, I, but I, I thought this is what you guys wanted. Beat the bushes. Go find it. Until it don't work Until out it that don't way. work out that way. Mm. And then something goes wrong. Now it's, why'd you do that? Mm. You can't win. You can't win. <laughs> you can't win. Which one is it? So talk talk me through, I guess, the way you police. I am an individual who 100% goes to work with absolutely no preconceived notions toward anything. Mm -hmm. I don't care who I encounter. I don't care what the circumstance is. I keep an open mind. I also want people to know my uniform does not define me. When I deal with people, one of the number one things, especially when I'm recognizing that they're doing it, Mm -hmm. we got to stop. Here's what needs to happen. I need you to understand... Our dialogue is going to be for whatever amount of time that I'm here dealing with you. Excuse me. I need you to to recognize very quickly throughout our dialogue, okay, he's a person. This this guy's talking to me. Mm -hmm. I don't care anything about this uniform. This this doesn't define me. This is just part of the process. I have to wear this. You and I are going to have conversation. That's what people do. We talk. We're going to have conversation. We exchange. We exchange. (laughs) We're going to have conversation. And then we're going to figure out what's going on here as we continue to have conversation. Done. Mm. Talk. And I recognize a lot of people on this job don't have people skills. You would think the simplest thing that we've been doing for years since we've been children, having conversation, you would think people had a better ability of just being able to hold conversation. Not everybody. And it's not there. <laughs> yeah. It's not there. Everybody doesn't have that. Everyone doesn't do it. No. You get people who get very flustered when individuals are like, well, I don't understand, and they're looking for the answers. They want. They have a bunch of questions, and they're expecting you to answer it. Why? The uniform says you know it all. Yeah. Or if you don't know it all, the uniform says you know what you're supposed to do while you're here dealing with me. People get flustered when you ask questions, too many questions. Because now you're expected to answer. Yeah. I, I got to be honest. I don't think in most cases when I've been pulled over or even questioned by an officer, I feel like I can't ask questions. Um, you can. I mean, I know that I can. Ultimately, I think in most of my experiences, and I can't talk about anybody else's, the environment is doesn't seem conducive hmm. for questions. It seems like I'm telling you what it is and I want you to shut up mm. and just listen. Like I have, I think, and I'm trying to think, because I, I don't think all of my experiences with cops have been that, hmm. but the majority of them have been that, where I just feel like I'm just like, like I'm a child. <laughs> I go into child mode mm-hmm. and I can't speak. And it's, it's more of the, you know, the old school um, speak when you're spoken to. Right. Uh, and I'll tell you when to talk. Right. Like kind of that that parent to child thing that, again, I don't agree with, but kind of how I was raised. Like, you know, you're a child, you're there to be seen and not heard. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I'm definitely, I'm thinking like there's been, very, very few times that I've had an exchange with the officer that was a pleasant one, first and foremost, and one where I felt like I could be like, oh, well, why you pull me over mm-hmm. or whatever, whatever. I, I, now, the, it's crazy. I want just touching on that. Mm-hmm. I've said it to multiple people. I am a person who feels everyone is doing explanation. And what explaining yourself does is it, it, it eliminates you feeling like you don't know what's going on. So if I originally explain myself to you, whatever happens now, you can. I, the one thing that I make sure I do for a person is they cannot say they have no idea what's going on. Gotcha. So when I don't like everyone, I don't tell people how to police, but I don't like the "Do you know why I pulled you over?" I hate that question. I'm going to ask that all the time. It's like, no what do you want me to tell you? You know what <laughs> I, I mean? Know. Even if I did know, what do you expect for me to tell you? You know what I mean? You expect for me to sit here, oh, yeah, I mean, you must have pulled me over for that, that stop sign I ran back there. It's like, it's, it's I think it's a ridiculous question. Yeah. So you give people what they need, an explanation. Hey, officer so-and-so from whatever department pulled you over because on 3A Street, I was right behind you, you ran that stop sign. Just tell them what's going on. Because now I eliminate the aspect of, well, what what's happening? Why'd you do this? Yeah. That 100% is gone now. 
mm-hmm. driver's license registration. You don't even know what's going on. I was about to say, most of the time that I've been pulled over, I definitely didn't know why I was being pulled over. And I definitely gave them all of my information with not knowing, like, I don't know. I don't know what you, I don't know, I, I don't know why you. I've had some cops say to me they do it that way because if in the event something does go bad, they are they now already have the person's information. Mm. It's like, okay, listen, to each his own. But here's my thing. If it's going to go bad, it's going to go bad. I was about to say. So you having mean? my information, I mean, it's not going to matter. Because guess what? If I don't give you my information, I still can't leave. One way or another, and if I'm, and my thing is, if my intent is to leave anyway, to get away from you, mm-hmm. that's going to happen anyway. I'm anyway. going to wait till you get out that car, and I'm out. Yeah. So it's going to happen anyway. That, that, that whole question, to me, in my opinion, does not prevent anything. If someone doesn't want to give you their information, they're not going to. Nope. Period. And the situation is just going to play out the way it plays out. It doesn't matter. And that can go on the other side, too. Just because I do it my way doesn't mean the situation is going to go good. Yeah. But I do that for me. Because what that does for me is I know I did everything in my power to make sure this situation went good. Gotcha. So if it does go bad, I know I did everything in my power to ensure that it did go good. So, I mean, to each his own, everyone has their own, ta- their own tactics to it. So when communicating more with people, do you find that... People's response is different where you don't get into, you know what I mean? Not to say that things are always going to go well, Mm -hmm. like you said, but like, do you think that people, because you're humanizing them, because that's that's literally what that is. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when I've been any anything with officers, I just don't feel like a human. I feel... Yeah. We kind of cower down. I was about to say, you know I, what I, mean? I literally, and that's what I was going to, I shrink. We go into a shell. It's like we don't, and that's why, and listen, a big reason why I got into podcasting, mm-hmm. aside from all my personal beliefs about policing and, you know, aside from what I don't like about being a cop, mm-hmm. I recognize that there is a, a very big misunderstanding uh, between cops and in the general public. Absolutely. Part of my interactions with people while I am working, I always get a, I appreciate your approach. They forget about my uniform fairly quickly and we're just having conversation as two people. Yeah. And I started realizing that I got a lot of that. And it let me know that something that I was doing was working as it pertains to the approach. And I wanted to make sure that what I did was allow the the world to see that I'm human. And I have a—my life didn't start once I became a cop. I'll be 33 years old tomorrow. I have 33 years of experience in my life. Happy birthday. Appreciate you. (laughs) (laughs) I have 33 years of experience in my life. Okay. My, My life didn't start when I became a cop. Again, me and my old partner said it all the time. And I refer to him a lot because, you know, that, that's family. Yeah. We say it all the time. I'm new to the job. I'm not new to life. I have 33 years of experience. You don't know what I've encountered in my life, mm. professional or personal. So when you present that to people and they can and they can tell through your conversation, through your wordplay, through your dialogue, that this person literally is not speaking to me from the aspect of just what the job presents. Yeah. He, Talking life to me. I was about to say you give you giving them human. It's a human. You know what I mean. Interaction and the, things go so much better that way, happens. and that's why I I decided to move forward with creating this podcast because people need to know one the real facts and information that goes into this job. Mm-hmm. People need to also hear it from a, a different perspective. A person as myself who comes from urban America grew up in. Almost every hood in New York you could think of. Yeah. I lived in, listen, me and my mom and my brothers, we moved a lot. I lived in Queens. I lived in the Bronx. I lived in Harlem. I lived in Brooklyn. I've lived everywhere in New York. Mm. I've been in so many different situations in my life. So when I see the stuff going on out here now, and while I wear that uniform, 
all it does is just, re- just remind me where people are and what they really think about a, a certain a certain group of people or mm-hmm. certain neighborhoods. Yeah. Some of the stuff I've heard and seen while working, I'm just like, this is absurd. Mm-hmm. Like this is crazy. So my platform is 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 to enlighten people and let people know I'm here, and that's why I call myself the people's source. You are. I'm here to let you know it's okay. One, you have people who wear this uniform who understand, and you have people in this uniform who's willing to go against the grain to let you know that everything that happens in police world is not okay. Gotcha. So does your platform in any way jeopardize your job? Like, does it go against any codes or anything? Because I I think that's, too, why I'm sure you're not the only person, right, who probably polices the way that you police, feel the way that you feel. Um, I 100 percent think that your podcast is a movement um, that's just literally going to change an environment. Oh, so literally it will. Listen, you got to let let me speak it. Do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. Let me speak it. (laughs) That will that will literally change the world and how things are structured and break down the things that aren't structured the right right way and rebuild them the right way, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in that, and I, and I asked you that cause I, I look at you and I think, I think maybe one of your first episodes, I was like, man, he got a lot of courage because I don't think we see enough people going against a space and place that you have to go to every mm-hmm. day, first and foremost. And even though you may be more so focused on, um, and not focused on, but like Sometimes when you're speaking, you're speaking about NY and you're now in Houston, Mm -hmm. but you you have an overall opinion of being in law enforcement as a whole, right? So I guess where did that courage where you're just like, hey, I'm talking about this regardless of what it could mean for you? No different than, and hold on, no different than how you said the guy who's not getting enough tickets was put in a certain predicament. I mean, all in that. Not, I'm not. I'm not saying that. But right. So, first part. Of, first part of that question is, mm-hmm. I, because I am still current mm-hmm. uh, in this job. I I have to be extremely mindful of what I say. Yeah. Um, but I also know wordplay is everything, yeah. and I can articulate myself without saying anything to, I guess put myself in a position to where now I discredited the the job itself. Okay. Um the job my my uh department they don't care about what I say about another department. Oh gotcha. They care about what I say about their department. Their department. Gotcha. It's like don't discredit us. Yes. If you're gonna discredit anyone, discredit something else that you've been a part of. Don't discredit over here. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Because you still wear that uniform. Yeah. But they also can't dictate me giving myself a platform to ultimately do what I have a passion for, yeah. which is speak. This is therapeutic for me. This is this is this is this is my therapy. Yeah. Like I'm in I'm comfortable right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? This me is too. my this, this is my therapy. This is my therapy. <laughs> this is you know what, what I mean? I do for therapy, yeah. So again, I'm not concerned about that. That. You know what I mean? I'm not concerned about your opinion of me, like my counterparts. I don't break bread with most people on this job anyway. Gotcha. I go to work, do what I got to do, I go home. So most people on this job, I don't break bread with anyway. Mm -hmm. I think literally out of everyone I've met on this job, I have two people that I deal with outside of work, Other, you know, when it comes to this job. My man sitting right here with me and my other guy who lives in Houston right now who originally is from New York as well. Those are the only two people on this job that I deal with on the outside of work. So my thing is I also have an identity. I'm comfortable in my own skin. You can't make me uncomfortable. I love that, though. You know what I mean? And I'm I'm confident. You know what I mean? Like sometimes... You know, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't pat ourselves on the back enough. Like I'm a competent individual. You are. You know I'm, a, I mean? I'm a, pa- I'm a pat you <laughs> back. I'm com- competent. I'm competent. You are. So when I go to work, I know when I'm outside dealing with the people, I don't. I'm not gonna have any problems. Yeah. I'm not gonna have any problems. I'm very comfortable in my own skin. I know what I stand for. My, I, I'm, I morally, I know why I'm here. 
And this, you know, being able to sit here with you and have this discussion, this matters. Like, no, th- it does. This matters. No, it's, it does. It does matter. Not enough people on this job are talking about what's really happening. So what would you say to the person who is you, minus the courage to be or speak about that? Because I do think as people listen to this, and I have a lot of officers um, who I know listen to the show, like who may have a passion to speak about it. Cause I think for just for most of us, I don't, and I don't want to say everybody, I think you get to a point of courage. I don't, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you might know what's right, but everybody ain't in a place to say that and not say it. You might say it when we off camera, right? Right. You might have those conversations off camera. We might talk about those things, you know, in the car mm-hmm. and whatever we might discuss on the phone, but it's a different level of courage to get, before people, he doing this in front of a camera. It's a camera, we got a we got an engineer. You know what in the I mean? Back. This and, is you know you got your boy here, and there's you know I, I have thousands of listeners that listen to the mm-hmm. podcast, and the ability to be even more than that. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So like, what would you say to the person or the officer, the rookie, mm. at, right? Mm. The rookie who just came on the job and they six months in. Mm. How you was six months in? And they have that feeling, feeling like, okay, what you know, where am I supposed to go, and what am I supposed to do? Like, what would what what advice would you have for them, or what wisdom would you exchange with them? I would one hundred percent tell them, mm-hmm. make sure you know who you are first before you try to follow the person who you think is the leader, because bottom line is, you have people on this job who absolutely have no idea what they're doing. They probably have no idea why they're even here. And that person that you're following might not stand and might not have the same morals as you do and might not have the same code of ethics that you do. At six months, you need to know that everyone is not here for the same reasons. So you need to know Mm -hmm. what your reason is. When you get on this job, If you're that person who just needed a job, you took a test and you got hired, perfectly fine. But once you get here and you get into it, you need to establish reasoning behind it. Mm. Why are you doing this? And if you can't do that, take a step back and pay attention to what others on this job is doing. You're an adult. I don't care you got six months on the job. I don't, and that's another thing. I don't deem a person competent or incompetent based off the amount of time that they have on this job. Mm. You're an adult. So s- sit back, pay attention to what people are saying and doing, and I'm sure you can decipher what's right and what's wrong. And don't think because you have six months on the job, you can't say something. Because mm. bottom line is those cops that were out there with George Floyd were rookies too. Guess what? They just got found guilty of mm-hmm. being a part of that that whole process that that took place out there with him. No one cares about your time. You wear that, you better know why you're putting it on. That's my advice to anyone who gets on this job. If you put that uniform on, know why you're putting it on. Don't just put it on blind. Why are you wearing that? And that was my biggest thing eventually for me. It was, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Because there's a lot of things I I'll say it on the record. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things I don't care about. Like I'm just being perfectly transparent. There's a lot of things I don't care about. I don't care that you didn't signal. I don't care that you don't have your seatbelt on. I don't care that you're on your cell phone. Your mom might be sick. That might have to be a call you really have to take. I don't care. But I know I don't care. So I can have a certain approach to this job because I know I don't care. I got you. (laughs) You don't care probably, or you might care. If you care and you want to pull everybody in the world over who's on their cell phone because you think that's distracting them from seeing what's going on in front of them and that's your purpose, I'm all fine with it. I don't care how anyone approaches you about it. If that's what you believe and that's your reasoning and you truly believe it's right, do it. But if you're doing it because, well... That's just what they want. The quota. <laughs> yeah. Then I'm, the, I'm no good for me. 
Yeah. So you don't have an identity then. You don't know why you're here. Yeah. I got you. I love that because ultimately it's like, I think that's what every job or every, your purpose, you got to know your why mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And you know, I, for me, I have, I dream big. I want a lot. I dream, I dream really big. I don't believe that this job allows me to maximize my fullest potential. I, I believe that every dream that I have that I'm going to be able to conquer. And I'm not afraid to step out on faith. I know that I can get certain things accomplished. If all the energy that goes into me being a cop, yeah. if I put all that energy into myself, I'm going to be very, very successful. successful. Absolutely. So I dream big, and you know what? That means I got to do big things. I got to step outside the box a little bit. I can't go with the comfort of knowing I'm going to get a check every two weeks. Yeah. I'm going to do what I have to do. You're doing it. To get, you know what I mean? You're to get to where it. I want to go. You're doing it. And it's just part of it. It has to be done. You're doing it. I, um, first of all, I thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Number one. I thank you for having me. Um, I just want to say this to you. And you're going to do everything that you're supposed to do, mm-hmm. first and foremost. The the podcast will just give you the platform and open doors to what you really want to do and the change Absolutely. that you're going to make. So, um, but you just say get to me ready. on the phone. See, yeah. see you at the top, right? See you at the top. Like, <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I, you know, people always see you. Not that you don't see yourself, but people always see you further and higher than you see yourself. And I see that for you. And I know your podcast is bigger than just getting behind the mic and kind of you know, talking, we talked about that, that there is, there's purpose and there's heart in, in, in what you're doing mm-hmm. and it's going to a different level. Just prepare for, you know, what's I'm coming ready. in. Yeah. I'm ready. Prepare for it. I'm Cause like, it's going to come I'm, quick. That's I'm more than ready. All, that's, how it all, <laughs> that's how it all happens. But, um, for the audience who I know going to want to follow you. For sure. Look, uh, yeah. Tell you, them where to find you. You gotta, 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 gotta have faith in me. Um, <laughs> that's my middle name. You know what I mean? <laughs> Follow me on IG at Uncuffing the Truth. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook at Uncuffing the Truth. I am the people's source. My YouTube uh, YouTube channel is also Uncuffing the Truth. Um, we are doing some remarkable things. Um, we want people to know that we are not here to walk on eggshells. We want people to know that we are truly passionate about getting these messages out, but getting these messages out the right way. Um, our platform, you can go on YouTube, you can go on Apple Podcasts, you can find us on Spotify, you can find us on Google Podcasts. Please, please, please make sure that you tap in with Uncuffing the Truth. I promise y'all, we are being completely transparent, we are being honest, we are not pulling no strings, we're not playing any games. We're talking the real, we're giving people the truth, and that's all we're going to continue to do. So be, you know, be extremely patient with us. Um, Understand that we're going to get vulnerable at times and make sure that if you are a cop, and I'm going to end it with this, if you are a cop and you are a person who wants to speak and you want to to get your message out and let people know that, you know what, I have something to say, you make sure you reach out to me too because I know there's cops out here who feel exactly like me. And we can set something up, and we can get you in a safe environment on this platform and get you talking and get your message out the way it needs to get out as well. Uncuffing the truth. All right, y'all. So we will see you next week.